Um, Jazz, do you mind just looking after my phone, please? That, this is the passcode, like that. You all right? Thank you. Can you just look after that? Thanks. Alice, could you put the first picture up? Um, so you're going to see a picture of a pair of trapeze artists. And when I see this picture, the word that comes to my mind is trust. She trusts him, right? She's flying through the air, and she's got nothing underneath him. She's just hoping that he's going to be in the right position, ready to catch her. It's a very powerful image, isn't it? And I think it's especially powerful because she has had to leave the comfort of a sort of swing and throw herself into the air to be in that position of trust, ready to be caught. And I think it's powerful because I think sometimes in order to trust, we need to be willing to let go and sort of throw ourselves into the air. I've entrusted Jazz with my phone this morning, and I've had to hand it over to him. I've even given him the passcode, and I'm trusting he's not going to read my work emails or text my mum or whatever. <laughs> I think you'll be all right. Well, we know as Christians that we're called to trust God. But sometimes it's not very easy, is it? Maybe our head wants to, but our heart holds us back. Or our heart wants to, but our head holds us back. We know that he wants us to trust him with our money. But on the other hand, we've got bills to pay. And the bills are only getting higher and higher, aren't they? We know he wants us to trust us with our career, trust him with our career. But, you know, in the hard and fast world of business, where maybe you have to bend the rules a bit or shove others out of the way, how does that look? We know he wants us to trust him with our families. But as parents, we see our little ones growing up, making mistakes, trying to find their way in the world. Will they be all right? Or maybe we've got parents who are getting older and their care needs are getting more complicated and it's difficult to trust him with that. We know we're meant to trust in God's perfect timing, but sometimes he doesn't really move as quickly as we'd like him to. We might want to trust that God can heal today. But perhaps we've been praying for a long time and it hasn't happened for us yet. We know we're meant to trust that God is in control of everything, but then we look at the news and things just seem to get worse and worse and worse. As I've prepared this sermon, it's shown me areas in my heart where I need to learn to trust God more and more. And it's not easy to do. But what does the Bible have to say to us today as we try and trust him? We're going to read from Exodus uh, 16 in a moment, and we've been in the series looking at the story of God rescuing his people, uh, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt. He raised up a leader, Moses and his brother Aaron, to uh, lead them out, uh, and they escaped, uh, or Pharaoh let them go, and then they went towards the Red Sea, but then suddenly they're kind of pinned against the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's changed his mind. His army are chasing them, and they think, we're done for here. But then God miraculously parts the Red Sea, they uh, cross to safety, and the army is destroyed. And on the other side, uh, they celebrate God, and they, they, it says they put their faith in him. They put their trust in him. Well, today, we fast-forwarded a month, and God's led them into the middle of the wilderness. Uh, there's no food, there's not really much water, and they're getting hungry. So let's pick up from Exodus chapter 16. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they're to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it is the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. 
who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the, gra- when the dew was gone, thin flakes appeared like frost on the ground, on, uh, appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until the morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses got angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any more on the ground today. Six days you're together, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Now, I want to imagine this from the perspective of the average Israelite. You've been a slave in Egypt. You see God do some pretty impressive stuff to bring you out into the desert, but now you're hungry, starving even. And so you complain, and you're promised the meat and the bread, and miraculously, God brings these quail uh, migrating. They just land in your camp, easy pickings. And so that night, you go to bed with your belly full. You wake up the next morning and open the curtains of your tent, and oh, my word, it's like a white, Christmas out there, they don't have Christmas at that point, but it's like the whole ground is covered in this frost-like stuff sparkling in the morning sunshine. It's sort of like wafers. It tastes like honey. What is this stuff? And Moses says, this is the bread that God has given you to eat. But then Moses says something interesting. He says, you're only to take enough for today and eat it all up. No more, enough for today, and that's it. One omer per person, that's about a kilo and a half per person. What? Are you crazy, Moses? We're out here in this desert, starving to death. Suddenly God's provided food. I don't care how he's done it, but I'm taking as much as possible. Enough for today, tomorrow, maybe even a week if, if I can. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? Think about the panic buying in COVID, and that was when there was food. I'd be taking as much as I possibly could. So some people listen to Moses but you think, nah, I'm going to have some for today and store some in my pot for tomorrow. So you go to sleep with your belly full and wake up the next morning, lift the lid off your pot, and it absolutely stinks. It's rancid. It's full of maggots. All right, Moses, man has got a short shelf life. And you open the curtains of your tent, and once again, the ground is covered in this sparkling white manna. What's God doing here? Well, if you've got your Bibles open, have a look down at verse 4. God says, 
Well, he tells us what's his purpose in this whole passage. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. God's seeing if they're going to trust him for their daily bread. Now, in the 1800s, there was a famous tightrope walker called Charles Blondin, and he used to do his tightrope walking all over the world. But his favorite spot to do it was the Niagara Falls. So he'd stretch a tightrope between the Canadian side and the US side, and there's this great big gorge underneath, and walk across this tightrope, hundreds of feet above the water, with the waterfall thundering down beside him. And of course, the crowds loved it. And he'd do it, you know, he'd do it normally, and then he'd do it blindfolded. And then one time he, he took a chair and stood on the chair on the tightrope. I don't know how. Apparently one time he even cooked an omelette with a little stove on the tightrope. Well, one day he does one of these shows at Niagara Falls, and he walks across with this empty wheelbarrow. It takes him normally about 20, 25 minutes. And he gets to the other side, and the crowd are cheering, great stuff. And he calls for silence. And he says to the crowd, who here believes I could cross back over that tightrope, but with a person in this wheelbarrow? And the crowd go wild, of course you can, Blondin. You can do anything. You're amazing. And so he calls for quiet again, and he says, well, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> and you can hear a pin drop. You see, we heard back in chapter 14, after God had parted the Red Sea and delivered the Israelites, that they put their trust in him. And at that point, they're like the crowd, God, you are amazing, you can do anything. But then fast forward a few weeks, and now the rubbers hit the road, and God's saying, well, do you want to get in the wheelbarrow? Do you want to let me push you? Do you want to let go of all control and just trust that I'm going to get you what you need safely? You see, it's one thing to declare our faith or our trust in someone with our lips, but it's another thing to actually do so with our actions. Commentator Alec Motya said that there is no such thing as an untested faith. Faith, by definition, is not just our words, but it's also how we live it out in real life. But the problem is, if you read through the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Israelites, they actually don't make it where they're trying to get to, the promised land. Most of them just die in the wilderness. Why? Because again and again and again and again, they will not trust God. They won't obey him. Why? He's giving them the manna. He's providing for them. They've seen all this amazing stuff you're doing, and you're reading it going, guys, come on! He's God. He knows what he's doing. He's given you everything you need. Why won't you trust him? But the thing is, him providing manna isn't fixing the deeper spiritual issue. You see, he's, he provides for their physical needs, but inside, they still want to be in control. They still want to be in charge. They're not willing to give that over to God, and so they won't obey him. And isn't that the case today? You know, we've got more than enough in the culture we live in. You know, we've got everything we need. I've never had to worry about my daily bread, and yet, inside me, there's still this instinct to hold on and not trust God, even though I've got the whole Bible full of the things he's done, even though I can see that he's been faithful in my life, and yet something just wants to hold on. But the problem is when we want to be in the driving seat of our lives, there's only one destination, which is death. When we want to be in the driving seat, we say no to God, and we go our own way, away from him. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 6, about this story we're reading today. He says, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. The manna didn't fix the deeper spiritual issue of their rebellion against God. But, Jesus said, here, me, here is bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. You see, just as God rescued the Israelites from Egypt and brought them into freedom, that's a picture of what God does 
for you and for me if we'll come to him. We're in slavery to ourselves, to our sin. And God wants to rescue us and take us into that place of freedom. And we can only do that. We can't hand over the driving seat to God ourselves. We can't just will ourselves to do it. The only way is through Jesus, to come to him, the living bread, and it's him that brings us into that place of freedom. And we see God wants to give that freedom to the Israelites in this passage. So they're eating the daily bread each day. They, you know, they've got into the habit, take enough for today and there'll be more for tomorrow. Take enough for today and there'll be more for tomorrow. But then on Friday, Moses says something interesting again. He goes, well, today you're going to take enough for today and extra for tomorrow. Why? We tried that, Moses. It went moldy. But fine, I'll take enough for today and save some for tomorrow. And go to bed with your belly full and wake up the next morning and take the lid off your pot and, oh, it's all right. Tastes fine. Open the curtains of your tent and the floor is empty, no manna. Some people go out looking for manna. Maybe it's moved, but Moses says, no, 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 no. The point of this is that you've got food for today and you don't need to work. Today is a day off. A day off? What's that? These people are slaves. All they've done their whole lives is work until they die. That's all they know. But God's saying, no, 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 that was when you were slaves. Now you're free. And in freedom, I know what you need. I know you need a day off. And I want you to live in that. When you were slaves, you had to take, 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 and hold on to whatever you could because that was just how you survived. But now you're free. You can trust me for your daily bread. You see, a caterpillar lives its whole life crawling along the muddy floor. That's all it knows how to do. That's all it can do. But then one day, that caterpillar crawls into a chrysalis, and it emerges with wings, As a butterfly, it doesn't need to crawl on the muddy floor anymore because it can fly. You see a butterfly crawling on the ground, something's wrong. You say, what are you doing, butterfly? You don't need to be down there. Fly. And God, in the same way, lifts us out of the, the mud and brings us into a new way of living. But so often, as Christians, we're trying to sort of have a foot in each camp. Yeah, we want the, the, the freedom and the good stuff, but we just can't quite let go of the old way of living. But God doesn't invite us to live as slaves. He invites us to live as sons and daughters. Not a master to a worker, but in relationship. But we all know that relationships are built on trust. And if we believe that Jesus can give us eternal life, as he promises, do you believe that? Because if he can give you eternal life, surely he can look after tomorrow. I need to hear that myself every day. And so each day, God invites us to get in the wheelbarrow, to hand over control to him. Each day, God asks us, will you trust me? Will you trust me? What could it look like? Well, For Sahar, it looked pretty radical. You see, Sahar grew up in Iran. She was a Muslim her whole life. She was a mother and a wife of uh, two young kids. And one day she was given a Bible. And she encountered God through the Bible. And she became a Christian. That's a dangerous thing to do in Iran. And Sahar's biggest fear when she became a Christian was when she told her husband that he'd send her away and she'd be separated from her kids. But she chose to trust God, she told her husband, and he did just that. He sent her away, kicked her out of the house, she was separated from her kids. Her worst fear had come true. And yet, she said, in that moment, I think the turning point in my life in Christ was when I was praying in God's presence with all the challenges and questions and cares that I had. The only thing I knew was to trust God. The only thing I knew was to trust God. Now, eventually, Sahara and her husband reconciled. She moved back in with the family. But then one day, the secret police came knocking on the door. She spent 91 days in jail, and then she was sentenced to a further five years just for being a Christian. And now, 
the family have actually managed to escape. They live in Turkey. And she serves other women who are in a difficult, similar position, who have gone what, through what she has. And so she's seen God's faithfulness in the long run. But it's been hard, right? Now there's a faith being tested and tried. There's a faith that's not just words, but it's been proven to be true. But what could it look like for us in safe pinner? You see, that's the reality for many of our brothers and sisters around the world, but we have it much easier in some ways, don't we, in many ways. Well, it's interesting to me that Sahai was in that place of challenge and testing and trial, that she, that was where she learned to trust God. It wasn't when everything was going smoothly. So I'd love you um, to just do something with me this morning. I'd love you to take your hand and just in your lap, hold it up, in a, uh, not hold it up, but just clench it into a fist. And as you, you're clenching your fist, I wonder what it is that you're, that you're holding on to today. Now, it might be that actually you are going through a period of trial, of testing, like Sahar. It doesn't have to be as extreme as going to prison for it to be genuine testing, you know. And actually, you're trying to trust God, but it's difficult. And what you need to do today is just, like that trapeze artist flying through the air, put your hand up and say, God, I need you. I really need you. Or maybe uh, today, you're a bit like that butterfly. And you, know, you want to live in that freedom. You want to trust God, but there's just something holding you back. There's something that you're like, oh, I just can't quite let go of. And today, God's inviting you to open up your fists and hand it over to him. Or perhaps what you're holding is control of your life. Perhaps you're not a follower of Jesus, and, and you, know, you are the ruler of your life. But maybe this morning, what you want to do is open that fist to receive, to receive the bread of life. Because you know, when we're in the driving seat of our life, there's only one direction, and that's towards death. But in Jesus, we find eternal life. And not just eternal life for over there in the future, but also freedom today that we can never find when we're trapped in our own. So maybe today it's opening your hand to receive him for the first time. And so I'd love you to just hold that fist in front of you now. And we're going to have a moment of quiet. And I'm just going to pray. And maybe um, if you feel ready as you're just doing business with God yourself, Maybe you feel ready to put your hand up and say, Lord, I, I need you in the midst of this testing. Or maybe to open your hand and say, Lord, I give you this thing that I'm holding on to. Or, Lord, I don't even fully understand you, but I want to receive you for the first time. So let's just hold our hands in front of us, and if you feel ready, you can open it up as you pray. So Holy Spirit, you know us. You know what we face, what we struggle to deal with. And I pray that you just speak to us now with real clarity. Now, maybe you're actually not feeling like you're ready to open up your hand for whatever reason, and that's okay. You know, we're all, we're all a work in progress. We all need, we're all on a journey. We all need Jesus each day. But if you're struggling for any reason to open up, then we'd, we'd love to pray with you and work through whatever, whatever it is. You know, we're family here. So do come and find Pastor Manager or myself 
or anyone you trust afterwards to pray. Or perhaps this morning you did actually open your hand and you said, Jesus, I want to receive you this morning. And if so, definitely come and find us afterwards and we'd love to pray with you about that. And as we take communion in a moment, let's remember Jesus who lived as you and I did the perfect life and died as a perfect sacrifice so that we might have that eternal life. He is enough. He is enough for eternity. He is enough for tomorrow. And he is enough for today. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you that you long to rescue each one of us from bondage, from slavery, and bring us into a place of relationship with you and freedom. And Lord, you know the challenges we face. You know it's not easy to do that. But I thank you that as we look to your word, as we look to your work in our lives, we can see that you are faithful, you are able, and that we can trust you. And that even as we feel like we're flying through the air with nothing beneath us, you are ready to catch us. In Jesus' name, amen.